Good morning. Welcome to worship for our second uh, excursion into this strange thing of uh, online worship due to the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, my name's Michael Dixon. In case you don't know or not a regular member or visitor of this church, I am the pastor of Christ Ridge Presbyterian Church and will be leading us in worship today. Uh, just a couple of announcements again, in case you haven't figured it out, all church activities are currently postponed uh, for a season as we sort out exactly what's going on, what's wise, and how to use our resources as a church uh, in continuing the ministry of the church and caring for the saints here. Uh, two, I will give you a building update for those that have not been able to come by. If you haven't yet, it looks amazing. Uh, the steel is up. It's all welded and screwed together. We have uh, passed the weld inspection. Uh, further, on top of that, they've already uh, run the uh, plumbing conduit and stuff, and that has passed inspection as well, which means, Lord willing, this week we should be having a foundation poured around the edge of the, or uh, within the block work that we have up, uh, getting us set for walls to start going up, I think, a week or so after that. So the Lord's been very kind. Um, if you do decide to go for a drive at any point this week, I would encourage you to drive through the parking lot and uh, just admire the building and what God is doing there. All right, take a few moments as the prelude is played. Again, uh, it's, it's kind of our gift to the congregation here is to give us a moment to kind of focus and to prepare. Uh, normally, that's so important as we've gathered together because of the kind of frenetic and frantic thing that Sunday mornings can be of trying to get kiddos together and hairs combed and cereal eaten to get into the place of worship. But now, maybe a little bit different as you might be at home in your pajamas. Uh, I'm not in my pajamas today, but uh, to get our brains a moment to focus, uh, to quiet our hearts as we prepare to meet with God. Take a few moments. People of God, if the Lord has made you able, please stand. Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength, very present help 
in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea. Though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations rage, the kingdoms totter, he utters his voice, the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us, the God of Jacob is our fortress. Come behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolations on the earth. He makes war cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow, shatters the spear, he burns the chariots with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Amen. Let's sing number 92. Father and our God, 
It is a strange thing to gather together for worship with four of us in the room, our brothers and sisters at home. But we praise you that you are the mighty God that is not confined to a building, not confined to a tent, Not confined to a temple, but instead through the ministry of the Lord Jesus, the indwelling work of the Holy Spirit, how you meet with your people, dwell in and with your people, encourage your people, edify your people, receive praise from Christ who is the mediator for your people. We praise you. And Lord, we ask that even in this hour, you would teach us how to be still before you in heart. And how to worship before you. Not to be filled with self, but to be filled with Christ Jesus, who is our Savior. And even as we are still before you in heart, that we would then be quite vocal in mouth in praising the Savior who has redeemed us from the pit. We bless you, triune God, and we ask for Christ's sake that your Spirit would minister to your people, even stir up Worship in our hearts, for Christ's sake. Amen. Please be seated. Statement of need is Matthew 21, the triumphal entry appropriate on this unusual Palm Sunday. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethphage, to the Mount of Olives... Then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and with a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anything, if any excuse me, if anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord needs them. And he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, and on a colt the foal of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna! To the son of David, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up, saying, who is this? And the crowd said, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. And Jesus entered the temple. And drove out all who sold and bought in the temple. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. He said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer. But you make it a den of robbers. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. 
But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying out in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. And they said to him, Do you hear what these are saying? And Jesus said to them, Yes. Have you never read? Out of the mouth of infants and nursing babies, you have prepared praise. And leaving them, he went out of the city to Bethany and lodged there. In the morning, as he was returning to the city, he became hungry. And seeing a fig tree by the wayside, he went to it and found nothing on it but only leaves. And he said to it, May no fruit ever come from you again. And the fig tree withered at once. When the disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, How did the fig tree wither at once? And Jesus answered them, Truly I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what has been done to the fig tree, but even if you say to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, it will happen. And whatever you ask in prayer, you will receive if you have faith. Two points to note from this passage for uh, us in contemplating kind of a statement of need. One is the response of the crowd. Here you have this kind of great coronation event taking place as Jesus is brought into Jerusalem and the crowd rallies. Uh, they do all of the things that you would expect them to do when a king shows up. But the issue is he's not the king they expect as when he gets to the city instead of immediately killing the Romans and throwing them all out, he goes to the temple to cleanse it, to get rid of the Jews worshiping incorrectly. Instead of being the kind of savior they want, shaped in their own image, they're forced to contend with the type of savior that he is, which is why in just a few bits they turn on him. And the crowd that welcomed him in as king is the crowd that then executes him as villain. Second, in terms of contemplating the sin here is, interestingly, the disciples' response. Uh, Jesus has set his face to go to Jerusalem uh, after their great proclamation. They believe that he is the Messiah, the Son of God. And here, in the first part of 21, you see the coronation event. He comes into the city. Yay, here is King Jesus. And the next morning, as he goes back to the city, he's working on breakfast. He curses the fig tree. And the disciples' response is so interesting. <laughs> How did he do that? Did you forget what just happened the day before? Did you forget what you had said just a matter of days and weeks before, that this is the very Son of God? Why are you dis surprised when he displays his power? Why are you surprised when he showcases his mighty strength? Interestingly, the crowd wants a Savior in their own image, the disciples know their Savior, but forget two struggles, I think, that are common to the heart of mankind and appropriate for this reason that we confess our sins together. Let us pray. Father, with humility and sorrow, we confess we've grown unimpressed with your mighty acts of deliverance, both in us and around us. With daily regularity, we overlook them or forget them. And now we do not even expect them. We ask so little of you because we remember so little of you. As our remembrance of you subtracts, our anxieties multiply. 
We fear circumstances, not your loyalty. We fear cultural changes, not your power to redeem. We fear tomorrow, not savoring today's mercies. O Father, rend our hearts and open our eyes that we might see your great deeds. Savor them in our hearts. Expect them for tomorrow and love you rightly. Do this for our sake, we pray. And do this for Jesus' sake. Amen. Let's stand and sing 161. Promise of pardon in Matthew chapter 8. When he got into the boat, Jesus, his disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great storm on the sea, so that the boat was being swamped by the waves. (laughs) But Jesus was asleep. And they went and woke him, saying, Save us, Lord, we're perishing. And he said to them, why are you afraid? Oh, you of little faith. Then he rose and rebuked the winds and the sea. And there was a great calm. And the men marveled, saying, what sort of man is this? That even the winds and the sea obey him. Obviously, they're overwhelmed with his mighty power in getting to understand it so closely. But even more, they marvel, I think, or should be at least, marvel at his tender compassion. That he cares for them and will use his power to provide for them. Please be seated. Prayer of intercession comes from Psalm 120 today. Father in heaven, this psalm was sung as your people journeyed to the temple. Sung back and forth to each other in preparation for meeting with the living and true God. And even on that journey, they sang, In my distress, I called to the Lord, and he answered me. 
Deliver me, O Lord. Deliver me. Lord, we understand this psalm in a new way. Even today as we should be journeying together. To gather together as the people of God to meet in this place to worship with you. And yet, in your divine mercy, you have seen fit to put pause on that. And so we do cry aloud. Deliver us, O Lord. In our distress, deliver us. And we ask, O God, that you would deliver us even in the midst of this crazy pandemic. And we praise you that we are already reminded of your mighty power. Jesus rebukes the wind and the waves. He can easily rebuke a virus. And so we ask out of your great mercy that you would take this virus away. That your people may be able to gather together again. Lord, for a dozen years, this building has had that ringing sound of the songs of Zion. And now today we have the echoes of a piano in an unfilled room. Oh, Lord, help us. Deliver us. We pray for our elected officials. We know that in part, they are part of the mechanism that you will use to deliver us. And we pray for those women and men that are making extraordinarily difficult decisions. And we ask that you would give them wisdom. We know that every government that exists has been placed there by you for a purpose. We acknowledge that. We agree with your word. We submit to Romans 13. And so we do ask, O oh God, that you would pour out your wisdom on the president, on his advisors, on the doctors that he consults with, on the various governors of the various states, on the men and women that they seek consult with and education from. O oh Lord, pour out your wisdom that these, our elected officials, would make wise and excellent decisions. You've told us to pray for our uh, government and specifically to pray with this target in mind that we would be able to live a peaceful, quiet life. Father, we long to get back to that as a church. We long to get back to two worship services and then down to one in the new building. We long to get back to Sunday school where children and adults hear your word explained. That we would grow in our thinking and in our love. We long to get back to flocks with the people of God sharing food and fellowship together. We long to get back to Wednesday night prayer meeting where we gather together and present our requests and our needs and our desires and our thanksgivings to you, the mighty God. We long to be able to do this quietly, peacefully. And so we ask, deliver us, O oh God. Deliver us from the distress of this day. Because you love your people. And you care for us. We do ask that you would give us patience. Until that time, until you do answer these prayers with restoration, that you would give us patience, that you would give us humility, and that you would give us tenderness of soul. Increase our love for Jesus, we pray in his name. Amen. Let's stand and sing 235.
Let's give thanks to the Lord for the tithes and offerings that his people give. Again, now a little bit differently, either uh, through the mail or through the online giving on the website. Uh, You continue to provide and we give thanks to God for his provision through you, uh, particularly as we have building going up and bills still being paid. Let's give thanks to our God. Father, we do praise you that you have provided Money in the past and money in the present. And we rejoice that for you money is no big thing. You never labor from a position of scarcity. But for us it's something very important to buy things that are needful and in this case a building. And you are providing. And so we praise you and we ask your blessing on the tithes and offerings that the people of God give this day and throughout the week. For Christ's sake, amen. Be seated if you stood at home. Take your Bible and turn to Revelation 19. It does continue to feel weird to be preaching through this book as it seems like the world is ending outside. But God in His perfect wisdom had it planned long before we would ever understand. Get my notes ready. Revelation chapter 19. After this, I heard what seemed to be the loud voice of a great multitude in heaven crying out, Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Salvation, glory, and power belong to our God, for His judgments are true and just, for He has judged the great prostitute who corrupted the earth with her immorality and has avenged on her the blood of His servants. Once more, they cried out, Hallelujah! The smoke from her goes up forever and ever. And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God who was seated on the throne, saying, Amen, hallelujah. And from the throne came a voice saying, Praise our God, all you his servants, you who fear him, small and great. Then... I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude. Like the roar of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder, crying out, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give Him the glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come and His bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, Write this. Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Then he said to me, These are the true words of God. Then I fell down at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, you must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. 
For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Then I saw heaven opened and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called faithful and true and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire and on his head are many diadems. He has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood. And the name by which he is called is the Word of God. And the armies of heaven arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. And he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun. And with a loud voice, he called to all the birds that fly directly overhead. Come, gather for the great supper of God. To eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and their riders, and the flesh of all men, both free and slave, both small and great. And I saw the beast. And the kings of the earth with their armies gathered to make war against him who was sitting on the horse and against his army. And the beast was captured. And with it the false prophet who in its presence had done the signs by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who had worshipped its image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur, and the rest were slain by the sword that came from the mouth of him who is sitting on the horse, and all the birds were gorged with their flesh. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father in heaven, we do ask that you would give life and light to our hearts even as we now examine your word. We praise you that you use your word for the perfecting of your people. And we pray that you would do it now. For Christ's sake, amen. <clears throat> well, through this uh, world pandemic... The coronavirus chaos, it has produced some of the kind of, I think, most spectacular photographs that we've seen in really a long time. If you've been able to kind of hop on the internet at all and, and look around, you can see these amazing pictures of Paris empty, the Eiffel Tower with nobody there. All of the world monuments or the great cities of the world, the stuff in Rome where it's just empty streets. And how bizarre it is. Or maybe the more human pictures, some of the most kind of emotionally moving ones, with these pictures of the healthcare workers in some of the larger cities, largely in New York and such, where they're just wrecked, they're exhausted. They've been working 12 to 16 hour days, five to six to seven days a week. And you, you get these pictures of them just sound asleep in the hallway or having a private cry in the break room. The more moving ones in some cases for others, I guess, are the, the pictures of family greeting family through the windows of, you know, maybe a, a wife that's, I saw this one, a wife that was in a, uh, like a mental care facility as she was aging and her husband was not, but was not allowed in and him singing to her through the window. Or a friend who introducing his newborn child to the child's grandparents through the window where they couldn't spread germs. For me, one of the, the strangest sets of pictures, though, have been those of the weddings. 
where you have these pictures of pastors standing up front, and bride and groom there, and usually a couple of decorations right behind, and just an empty sanctuary. And just how, how strange it is. It's the same idea. The same wedding is taking place. It's just a little different. <laughs> There's no congregants. The service is probably, honestly, a bit shorter. I'm sure the singing is a little different with the three of them in the room. Photographer, I guess, four. But with no less joy. No less excitement. It's a wedding without some of the standard conventions that we're used to. Revelation chapter 19 is that same kind of setting, but kind of maybe on the other end of the uh, spectrum, the other extreme. It's a wedding, a wedding like we're accustomed to seeing, a wedding with all of the joy and the excitement, the intimacy and the delight, but with some of the standard conventions looking a little different. Instead of the, the bride coming in the back and the groom being up front, the roles are reversed. It's a wedding. It just looks a little different. Now, to understand that, you have to have a little bit of background on how Jewish weddings worked. And there were, in essence, five pieces to a Jewish wedding. We see almost all of them in Scripture in various places. Uh, this is well documented through archaeology and such. The first that you would kind of normally think of is the betrothal process. This is the point where a couple is legally married, but not enjoying all of the benefits of being legally married. They're legally married, but they're not intimate. They're not staying together. They're not living together. And good illustration is, don't think Joseph and Mary. Right? When Joseph finds out that Mary is pregnant, what's his first response? I will be an honorable man. And I will do the honorable thing. I will divorce her in private. Because he knows the child is not his. They're not being intimate. But he still has to divorce her. Because they're already married in a sense. The divorce has to happen because they're married, but because they weren't intimate. So uh, pregnancy obviously wasn't his. Now, after the betrothal took place and the, the bride and groom were joined in that legal sense, there was an interval, a period of in-between time. And it, during that in-between time, the groom would then pay the bride's price, pay the dowry, the bride price. It sometimes was money, sometimes was service, various ways that it could be paid for. In this one, think Jacob with Rachel and Leah. Remember, he goes and he works for his father-in-law for seven years, finds out, uh-oh, I married the wrong one. I'll work for another seven years in order to marry the one I want. There's a, an interval. It's where the negotiating was accomplished, so to speak. Then, uh, when the great day of the wedding took place, the third thing that happened was the great processional. The groom and all of his you know, compatriots would then get together his companions, and they would process to the bride's house. They would have the big kind of parade, the big song and dance, uh, and they would go to the bride's house where they would get her and take her back to his house, or more likely uh, to his parents' house where he still lived. And when they got back, there would be kind of the final two parts. You would have the final bit of the wedding ceremony, the, the thing that marked the completion of it all, the consummation then uh, set to take place. And then you would have a feast that would last anywhere. Uh, usually a week would be a, a good number, sometimes longer, sometimes a little bit shorter. Right? They knew how to do weddings. They also were, uh, had to have been staggeringly expensive. Uh, but you then partied for a long time. What's taking place in Revelation chapter 19 is really where we get to see the final two steps taking place. If you really wanted to be kind of thoughtful, you could say the entirety of the New Testament particularly, but even the Old Testament, is telling the story of that bride and groom. 
One of the commentators who wrote on this said, I think probably as beautifully as I've read anywhere, he said, in Christ, the bride was chosen from all eternity. Throughout the entire Old Testament era, the wedding was announced. Next, the Son of God assumed our flesh and blood, and the betrothal took place. The price, the dowry, the bride price, was paid on Calvary, and now, where we live, after an interval, which in the eyes of God is but a little while, the bridegroom returns, and it has come. The wedding of the Lamb. Hendrickson notes, I think, just with spectacular clarity and elegance of language that uh, this is the wedding that was arranged before the foundation of the world. This was the wedding that was arranged in that inter-Trinitarian agreement for the plan of salvation to take place where Christ would redeem for the Father a people and how that redemption would take place is through that great marriage relationship. That's why it's then given in the garden to help Adam and Eve and all of mankind understand what our relationship with Jesus Christ will be. It was promised in Genesis 3. It was announced every chapter of the Bible after Genesis 3, sometimes with greater clarity as in the Abrahamic covenant or the Davidic covenant or even the new covenant, sometimes with maybe a bit less clarity. But all of the Old Testament singing a great song of the wedding that would take place. Until Jesus steps inside time and space, steps inside humanity, puts on not just the clothing of mankind, but puts on the very nature of mankind, becoming a man. And winning for himself his bride. Living that perfect life, dying that unjust death, being raised in perfection, even ascending into glory. He paid on Calvary in his active and passive obedience. He paid the bride price so that God's people would be that perfect bride. And it's important to note that the bride doesn't pay in that culture. The groom does. It's the groom who spends all of himself to accomplish that wedding. And Christ has done it. That wedding that was promised at the found, before the foundation of the world, that wedding that has been announced throughout the entirety of the Old Testament, that wedding that has been accomplished throughout the entirety of the New Testament, now here happens in chapter 19. The processional takes place. Christ returns from the heavenly places to earth to uh, gather his people together. And we see the wedding and the feast. Verses 1 through 10 highlight that kind of the the wedding ceremony, what's taking place as part of this. And what's taking place in here in the original is really quite staggering and something that I think our ears maybe don't fully catch and uh, is a bit surprising. Uh, Verses 1 through um, 10 capture uh, the excitement of the great wedding ceremony by using something that for a Jew would have grabbed their ears and almost pulled them off. We don't because we have such a, a kind of a plethora of praise and worship songs that in verse 1 where it says, look, I heard what seemed to be this great multitude, all of the people, the saints of heaven, crying out in praise, all of the angels, all of the saints, all of the elders, all of God's creatures praising him. The first word out of their mouth is hallelujah. And we go, well, yes, amen, hallelujah. Except for a Jew, that would have been shocking. Because that word's not used anywhere in the New Testament except for this chapter. 
In fact, actually, it's not used very much at all in the Bible. Depending on kind of how you count, in the neighborhood of a little bit less than 50 uses. Almost all of them are confined to a very specific category of psalm, largely counting from about 111 through 150. The psalms, uh, most of the time it's used as the beginning and the end of the psalm, praising God for his mighty deeds. So what happens here in chapter 19 is that the fullness, the entirety of the people of God and his angels that praise him take up the song of the Old Testament. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise Yah, Yahweh. Praise our God. Praise our mighty God for his mighty power. That's what that word is, means and is used for in the Old Testament is praising God specifically for what he has accomplished. And here now, taken up again for the first time in the New Testament. Four uses in the same chapter is the only time. Uh, praising God for what he has accomplished. And now it's not accomplishing it in creation. It's not accomplishing it in simply delivering in the Exodus. It's accomplishing the salvation of the people of God in totality. There's no more hiccups. There's no more bumps in the road. There's no more points for cause and concern. There's no more heartaches or hurts or frustrations. There's no more waking up and being sad in the morning. Hallelujah. Praise God. Salvation is accomplished. Salvation and glory and power belong to our God. Why? His judgments are true and just, and he is victorious over and against all of his enemies. The great prostitute, that great city of Babylon, that great city of Rome, that portrait of all of the governments and all of the culture of mankind that is arrayed against God Almighty, the world that has set itself against our God, it has been defeated. He's judged this. He's avenged on her the blood of his people that they have poured out. All of the martyrs have been avenged. Hallelujah. Second one, the smoke from her goes up forever and ever. And that right there is a, an illustration maybe a little bit lost on us. And praise God for most of us, that's because we've not been in combat most of us probably haven't served in the armed services or seen action in far parts of the world, but when you destroy a city, you burn it. When you conquer a people, you burn their place. And here, what's happening is this victory is so total that the city burns forever. It's not one of those where it burns out and can be rebuilt later. It, it, the judgment is so complete and total. Verse 4, again, the saints here, the elders and the four living creatures take up the song, Amen, we agree, praise God, hallelujah. Praise our God, all you His servants who fear Him, small and great. Verse 6, there's a, a slight change of probably uh, focus as now it, it shifts from the kind of heavenly nature of the people of God to the earthly nature of the people of God. The emphasis is on the church. And I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, the saints gathered from throughout time and location, here singing the song of the wedding. Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give Him the glory. Why? Because the marriage is here now. It's time.
And the convention is a little bit different. It's the same idea of a wedding, but here it explains a little bit different uh, how it would have looked for them. Instead of, as I mentioned, the groom being up front waiting for the bride to open the door in the back in the American and English wedding, the bride is the focus of the wedding. In the Jewish one, it's the groom that's the focus. So here it's highlighting, look, the church is supposed to be in praise and in delight and in honor. Why? Because the Lord has accomplished this salvation so much that the marriage is going to take place. And look at the condition of the church in verse 7 and 8. She's ready. (laughs) She's ready. Gone is all of the panicky bit of getting hair ready and getting makeup ready and getting the dress just right and getting everything, you know, all of the final little details. But she, she made it. And in fact, actually, not only was she ready, has she made it, she was in verse 8, given the right thing to wear. Clothed herself with fine linen, bright and pure. And again, thinking in a culture that does not have, uh, you know, electric washing machines where you can wash anything at any time. Uh, bright white would have been very difficult to accomplish. I mean, thinking you don't have bleach the same way that we have today. You don't have the, the modern washing machines. It, it would have been really hard. And here you have the bride arrayed in just the most excellent of craftsmanship, the most expensive of clothing, and the brightest of white, highlighting her purity. It's marvelous. And John gives commentary for us to, okay, by the way, this is not a literal picture. In case you hadn't figured that out thus far in the book, this is not a literal picture. In fact, he actually explains that to us in verse 8. She's clothed in fine linen, bright and pure. And oh yeah, by the way, her dress isn't actually a dress. It's the righteous deeds of the saints. That's the portrait of what she's clothed in. And think about that the church is, when she goes into this great marriage feast, into this great marriage ceremony, she is clothed in the righteous Actions that she has accomplished through the Holy Spirit working in her because Jesus has already redeemed her and is sanctifying her even now. Her salvation is real and powerful and true and is genuine. Even her actions showcase it. And I love how verses 9 and 10 capture the kind of backdrop in the room. How exciting of an event is this? How glorious of an event is this? John is there. He's, at this point, you gather in some way overwhelmed. And the marriage ceremony is so magnificent. And the singing is so magnificent that the angel next to him turns to him and says, Oh yeah, by the way, write this down. Blessed is anybody that gets to be a part of this. That would have been the most obvious statement I think you could probably imagine. Well, no joke. This is amazing. Anybody would want to be a part of this. This great marriage. God throwing a party with all of the resources of heaven. Yes, I think I would like to be a part of that. Write this down. (laughs) This is true. This is what God says. Blessed is anyone who makes it into this number to be a part of the people of God. And John, overwhelmed with the moment, overwhelmed with the beauty, overwhelmed with the glory, he he starts worshiping the angel next to him. I, I love that. It's probably my favorite part in here. And I don't think it's a highlight of the weakness of John. Instead, it's a highlight of the glory of the occasion. This wedding party is so marvelous that John is in like sensory overload. And when he finally gets to have a conversation, he just starts worshiping because he doesn't know what else to do. And the angel's like, stop, what are you doing? I'm a guest too. (laughs) Worship the Savior. Worship Jesus. Don't worship me. It's that good of a party. 
You think, wow, that's, I mean, that's amazing. Everybody's praising. Everybody's excited. Salvation is accomplished. The bride is ready. But the interesting thing is that they haven't exactly given us the reason for celebrating. They've explained the excitement. They explained that the bride is prepared. They explained that the background is beautiful. But they haven't yet explained why. Specifically, the groom, the church is so thrilled. It's in verse 11. It's almost like, again, think American, uh, American mind. This is the point where here comes the bride is played and the entire congregation stands and the doors in the back are opened. That's verse 11. That's for our convention. <laughs> for them, it's a little different. He looks in the back and here comes the groom and he looks a little different than you would expect. Our grooms, it's, you know, bow tie suit, uh, you know, maybe tuxedo, cummerbund, maybe, I guess, I don't know anymore. This one looks a little different. He sees heaven open, the glory of God, not the doors to the back of the church, the glory of God splits open, and here comes a horse. Wow, that was unexpected. This groom shows up to his wedding on a horse and rides it up to the front. I mean, that's a power move. That's pretty cool. However, again, it's noted he's, it's a white horse. He, he is the one who's coming in honor and purity. And again, in a world that, that purity is so rare. Here you have a bride that's clothed in purity and a groom that's arriving in purity riding on a white horse and the one sitting on it is called. And now it, it does a number of things here. It describes the groom by assigning his character as his name, but highlighting that his real name, his most intimate name, is ultimately only known by the Godhead. So this one, this groom who shows up, well, what is his character? Well, this is what we call him by. He is the one who is faithful. He accomplished the salvation. He's true. He speaks the truth. He's righteous. He judges. He makes war. This is not a sissy groom showing up. In fact, actually, he shows up. <laughs> Verse 12, his eyes are like a flame of fire. That's, again, highlighting the anger and the wrath of God. On his head, he has uh, the glory of crowns, the regality of, of authority, of, of rule. He is a king. And he's clothed, weirdly enough, in a robe dipped in blood. I suspect it's likely the blood of his enemies, but it could certainly be a reference to his own blood on the cross. And he's called the word of God. And when he comes down the aisle on his horse, clothed in might and power and glory and purity and beauty, he brings with him not groomsmen. He brings with him an army. The entirety of the church shows up with him, also clothed in white clothing and purity, riding on horses. He shows up ready for battle. This is the most impressive wedding procession in history. Rides down the aisle, and we find out, oh yeah, by the way, he's fully equipped to care for his bride. Out of his mouth comes a sharp sword. He's ready to kill anyone and everything that would harm his bride. He's ready to strike down the nations. He's ready to rule because he is a king. No one will be able to question his authority. And he will, he has, accomplished this salvation by handling even God's wrath itself. And his clothing is even marked highlighting that he is the highest of kings, he is the highest of lords. And he gathers his bride from the front, so to speak, again, using American conventions. I suspect the illustration is probably he throws her up on the horse behind him. She wraps her arms around and they ride off to the party. This groom showing up not simply in fancy dress, but in the fancy dress of war. 
This is a king who has returned from combat, who has destroyed his enemies. And so he, he takes his bride and runs her off to now the great feast. And interestingly, this feast doesn't last for seven days as your average Jewish wedding would last. It lasts for all eternity. Only this feast is a twofold feast. It's a, it's a double feast. You get two for the price of one. Verses 17 through 21 highlight the nature of that feast and the dual nature of it where God's people are sequestered away with their God. The bride and groom feast together for all eternity while outside something very different happens. An angel calls all of the birds of the field. And this is again illustrative. It's symbolic. It's not uh, literal calls all of the birds to come and to feast. This is uh, not an unknown phenomenon back when uh, combat was fought in a field with large numbers of people together, not fought via missiles and technology and hacking and things like that. When the armies would get together and you could approach, it was one of the ways you could track the armies was by seeing the birds circling. Because... The death brought the carrion birds. The leftovers of food and things like that brought the other birds. And it was a way you could see the presence of the army here. It's being recognized. What's happening is, is Jesus and his church are inside fellowshipping together in, in intimacy, in union, in delight, and in joy, and outside the carrion birds are feasting upon his enemies because they are destroyed in totality. And it, it highlights, it goes through the list to note, oh yes, the, uh, all of them, the world, the flesh, and the devil, they're all outside. They, they're all being destroyed. And whereas this feast lasts for all eternity for those inside, this feast lasts for all eternity on those outside. Whereas the church will dwell with Christ for all eternity, his enemies will undergo the wrath of God Almighty for all eternity. Whereas we are raised with new bodies unto life, they are raised with new bodies unto death forever. The great double feast of the Lamb. And I would suggest for those of us today, we, we are those that are betrothed to the Lord Jesus. We live in the interval between Him accomplishing our salvation and Him consummating our salvation. We are those waiting for the procession of the groom. And I would say there are a number of things that we should specifically take away and think about and live differently in light of. First, it notes all throughout this, but specifically, the bride made herself ready when the groom showed up. And I would suggest that is our task. For those that are married or have been a part of a wedding, you know that it seems like the details are innumerable. The preparation, the getting the table decorations right, getting the invitations right, getting that this and that and this and that, innumerable details. But it's a really a once in a lifetime event in size and scope in executing something that is life alteringly large. And it is our task as Christians today to be ready to live our lives in such a way as to be ready to clothe ourselves in those righteous acts, to be uh, living in light of God's redeeming mercy so that we would be cultivating holy behaviors, holy lifestyles, holy passions, holy cravings. Spend your life getting ready for this moment. 
I love how this one doesn't highlight, so much is left out of this. It, it never once mentions how much money people made. It never once mentions how successful they were at whatever they valued. Everything is defined in this moment by proximity to the groom. One of the things that this coronavirus pandemic is doing is it's really helping people reevaluate some of the metrics that we've used to evaluate what's important. It's challenging us to think about what, what actually is important. Now that some of these things I can't do and some of these things I want to do and some of these things I should do but I don't want to do and what is important. And it's interesting, this is the important. We need to be careful to live that way. Uh, secondly, in terms of challenge, it would be a very sad wedding where the bride was not interested in knowing the groom. Where the wedding takes place and she just can't be bothered. I mean, she knows the big picture of who he is, but she doesn't want to know all of the ins and outs, all of the details, all of the person and work and what he's accomplished and what's important to him and what he values and what's special to him and who he is. And I do wonder sometimes if we don't, as Christians today, even struggle with that same thing. Where we long for the party. We want sin to be taken away. We want tears to be taken away. We want cancer to be taken away. We want pain to be taken away. We want hurt feelings to be taken away. But we're really not that interested in the groom. And I would challenge you to think about that. Think about your own spiritual condition. How much of it is you're interested in the benefits of Christianity, but you're not interested in the person of Christianity. It's why for much of church history, certainly in our theological tradition, they have explained that the height, that the most important aspect of spirituality, the most important part of, of what it means to be a Christian, is nourishing and nurturing our union with Jesus. You see, all of Christianity can be explained just very simply. If we were joined to Adam when Adam sinned, that's why we got all of the judgment. But in redemption, that kind of joining with Adam is, is removed in some sense, and we're joined with Jesus. So that everything we do, we do in Christ Jesus. The worship that we bring to God when we actually worship here on Sunday mornings together, it, it's not our worship we're bringing to God. Thankfully, ours is, is quite poor at times. We're bringing Christ's worship. The same way that when God the Father looks at us and sees his beloved child, he's not seeing us, he's seeing Christ. The fullness of Christianity is celebrated in our union with Jesus. It's why the, the kind of high pinnacle point of salvation is described in wedding terms, and it's described really as that consum consummating process of the wedding, of, of this great intense intimacy of the celebrating of the wedding feast of the Lamb. How many of us are interested in the party, but not interested in the person? And I would encourage you, as the Spirit convicts you and as you go from this, to really recommit yourself, endeavor to get to know the person of the Lord Christ and to love him. With all your heart, let's pray. Father, we thank you for the Lord Jesus, how he has accomplished our salvation. We thank you that we can come to you in prayer, not in ourselves, but in Christ, unified with him. We thank you that our salvation is accomplished in King Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing 580.
Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations and forever and ever. Amen.